Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Leah Gropo, um, and I am here to um, let everybody know today we have a great speaker. His name is Michael Blumen. Um, he has a residency. Um, he's in his residency for pharmacy at Stanford Healthcare. Um, just a little bit about him. He was born and raised in San Diego. Um, he got his bachelor's of science in pharmacological chemistry at UC San Diego. Um, and then he graduated with his farm, um, farm D um, from UCSF School of Pharmacy in 2021. Um, so right now he's one of our residents. Um, and his interests really lie in chronic disease management. So diabetes, hypertension, um, hyperlipidemia. And so we're really fortunate to have him here today. Um, I will say if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A and um, I'll be looking for that and asking Michael as we go through um, those questions. And we definitely will have some time at the end to answer those as well. So without further ado, Michael. Thank you, Leah. Good to see everyone on. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint and we can get started. Okay. All right. So today we're going to talk about a few different topics. But generally speaking, this presentation is about how to navigate medication management in the setting of diabetes. So some of the objectives uh, and kind of the, the picture for what, what we're gonna do today, uh, we're gonna talk about how to lower medication costs and various cost saving programs. Uh, understand the difference between generic medications and brand medications, some of the myths and facts between the two. Uh, we're gonna talk about continuous glucose monitors, also known as CGMs, which you may have seen on some fun commercials and are a new tool that we really love to use when we, uh, manage diabetes. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about some over-the-counter supplements uh, for type two diabetes, whether they're safe or not, and what the evidence is behind them. If you have any questions uh, about one specific topic, feel free, to, uh, feel free to put it in the chat or ask as that topic ends. If you have any longer questions or more personal questions, of course, you can ask that at, at the end as well. So the first section we're going to go over is managing medication costs. So the first type of program is called a copay card. This copay card is usually offered by the drug manufacturer to reduce your out-of-pocket costs or your copay costs. So uh, whatever is left over after insurance has picked up, you know, a certain portion of the bill. Typically, these are reserved for uh, medications that are brand only, maybe a little more expensive where there's no cheaper generic option. You would enroll uh, at, on the manufacturer's website so you can search, you know, Jardian's coupon card. It'll take you to uh, the manufacturer's website. From there, you'd put in some information. It would bring up a coupon card. You would print that card, and then you could bring that to the pharmacy. Now, the main thing I wanna emphasize with copay cards is while it sounds really nice, you must have commercial or private insurance to use them. So if you have Medicare, Medicaid, or any government health uh, insurance, you will not qualify for these copay cards. These copay cards stack on top of private commercial insurance. Some other uh, kind of downsides of copay cards is it could be a little confusing to walk through, but you know we're always here to, to help you walk through that process. You can always ask your provider, whether that be a pharmacist or a, do a doctor, whoever it is, um, they can help walk through that and see if there's any extra savings available for you. Next, we have patient assistance programs. These are again, sponsored by the drug company, uh, typically reserved for these higher cost brand only medications. Usually with these programs, there's some sort of eligibility requirements. Um, it's typically targeted towards seniors, low income individuals or people with disabilities. Um, and it can provide you with free or very low cost medications that would typically be of very high cost. Some general eligibility requirements is you have to be a legal resident of the US. You have to be uninsured or uh, your insurance basically won't cover your medication underinsured. Um, and you have to meet certain income eligibility requirements. So it is a little, uh, it, it is tougher to, to, to be eligible for one of these programs. It's stricter than it is for like a coupon card, which basically you just need commercial insurance for. So here is an example. You can always search these, these 
programs on Google. If I wrote, you know, Victoza is a type of medication, Victoza patient assistance program, one of the first links would be the manufacturer's website explaining who applies, who's eligible, how to apply. Another way to look up um, what these patient assistance programs are is through this Medicare.gov website. So this Medicare.gov website um, allows you to search the drug. So here we have search Victoza and it brings up the Novo Nordisk, the manufacturer's patient assistance program, and it spells out the patient uh, or the eligibility criteria. So you must be a citizen or legal resident. You have, uh, you cannot qualify if you have any private prescription insurance or any commercial coverage or any federal state uh, or local program such as Medicare or Medicaid, unless you're in the donut hole and you're paying a high cost um, and you've been denied from a different program, which we'll talk about called extra help. So as you can see, they start to lay out a lot of different eligibility requirements. So this website is nice because before even logging in onto the manufacturer's website and going through all that search, you can see from a quick glance whether or not you will be eligible uh, to use this program to save some money. One of the programs that I just mentioned is called Medicare Extra Help. Uh, so this is basically uh, an program that helps lower your costs um, that for co-pays and deductibles, et cetera. Uh, it's very easy to find. You literally just search on Google Medicare Extra Help. I would encourage anyone with Medicare uh, to search this, find the website, and I'll show it on the next page, and, uh, and see if you are eligible or you apply. Basically, to be eligible, you have to have Medicare limited resources and income. And even if you don't meet their income cut off, you still may receive some sort of uh, financial assistance. And of course, you have to reside within one of the 50 states or DC. It's good, it's just a good habit to check. Uh, you may be surprised and you may, you may be um, eligible to save uh, a little bit with this program. The program, as this is the website from, from the government website, the program is valued at up to $5,000 per year. Of course, that depends on your eligibility. Uh, this is the website, how it looks. You would click on this blue button that says apply for extra help with Medicare prescription drug plan costs, and that would take you through the application process, which would determine whether you're eligible or not. The website link is down here below, but if you search Medicare extra help, you will, the, one of the first two res, results on Google is this website. So highly encourage uh, patients to check this out. You never know if you're eligible or not. If you feel like your drug coverage is too high and you're underinsured, um, I, would, I would definitely check this out. Next is a company called GoodRx. I have seen this commercial more times than I can think on TV. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this commercial. This is an interesting, uh, interesting company. Essentially, what they've done is they've helped you see without any membership or any fees, just a comparison of costs of different medication at uh, local pharmacies near you. So in this example on the right side, you can see they've searched Lisinopril, 20 milligrams, 30 tablets. And Publix, Walmart, Kroger, Walgreens, these different participating pharmacies, and a lot of them are participating in this program. Uh, their prices will come up for this medication. Luckily, lisinopril is a well-known generic medication. It's a fairly inexpensive, so you can see the prices here. Um, what GoodRx does, though, uh, is it takes place of your insurance. So you can't use insurance on top of GoodRx. So essentially, you would, if you see a price you like, you would click on it. It would give you this coupon, which you can see down here below for a Torvastat and $10.63. It has these numbers and codes, which the pharmacy will put in for you. Um, and it takes place of your insurance for this prescription. So it's important to note that you should always run your, your prescriptions through your regular insurance and see what that gives you. If you feel like that's too high um, or the number you've seen on GoodRx is lower than that, then that would be a time maybe you would think about replacing your insurance for this prescription with this temporary GoodRx discount uh, coupon. Once again, you cannot uh, use this on top of insurance. This replaces it. So it's also possible that their prices are higher than what your insurance would cover. It's always good to check both. 
Um, to use this at a pharmacy, you just need to bring them this coupon they, the, or maybe even show them on your phone. The pharmacy essentially needs this member ID, RX group, RX bin number, RX PCN number to process this as if it was your insurance for this particular prescription. GetRx also offers a membership now. I believe it just gives you extra, extra um, savings or better coupons, but to use it, it's completely free. To get these coupons, a lot of the coupons, you don't need any membership or, or uh, you don't have to pay any fees or anything like that. An interesting, uh, interesting resource if you're in the county of Santa Clara is Better Health Pharmacy. This is a pharmacy run by the public health department in the county of Santa Clara. Um, and this pharmacy takes in medications donated from other healthcare organizations such as Stanford. Um, it will, this pharmacy will dispense medications at no cost as long as you have a valid prescription. So it doesn't matter if you have insurance, it doesn't, uh, you will not have a copay. Um, the biggest caveat being is, as you can imagine, they have a very limited, uh, limited stock of medication, typically generic uh, medications that are lower cost. Uh, and then they don't carry any controlled uh, drugs. So any, um, for example, things like Lyrica, uh, things like Norco, Xanax, any medication that is a controlled medication, they won't carry at this pharmacy. It's always uh, best to double check if they have a medication that you are looking for. The best way to do that is to go on their website. So the Better Health Pharmacy website, we have it below, but if you search it, uh, it took me you know, about five seconds on Google. It's one of the first links. It'll come up with their sample inventory. This is a list I've taken from November 8th, so very recent. And they break down the medication based on what type of medication it is. So at the top, we have the blood pressure medication, and we have cholesterol medication. At the bottom, we have the diabetes medication. So things that would apply to, to what we're talking about today. <clears throat> As you can see, most of these medications are are the lower cost medications. And they do have some insulins, um, but this is just a sample inventory list. This is not guarantee that they have this medication. So this is things they may carry, but they may not have at that moment, um, at that exact time. So if you are looking uh, to have some extra help on covering your medication costs, uh, you could see if they have your medication. If you had a valid prescription, it would be no cost. Next is a few different programs from Walmart. They have some interesting programs that I only learned about this year and they're, they're uh, pretty good. Uh, the first one is about their over-the-counter insulin. Uh, they, their insulin brand is called Relyon. You can see it here in the middle, the Walmart brand is called Relyon. It costs $25 a vial for these specific types of over-the-counter insulins. So they have the regular insulin, they have insulin NPH and they have this premix 7030 insulin. Before you go and pick up one of these insulins, if you feel like it's much cheaper, definitely talk to your provider, whoever's managed your diabetes, because in different uh, types of insulin have different uh, effects over time. So uh, just because you take you know, 10 units of X insulin, it doesn't automatically mean you can take 10 units of Y insulin. They work at different time periods, they cover different times of your day. Uh, but if you feel like you would have benefit from, from this insulin pricing, uh, given that it's over the counter and it's maybe cheaper than what you're getting as a prescription covered by insurance, talk to your provider and see how you could switch to one of these insulins and if it truly would be beneficial both from a cost perspective and from your regimen if it works for you that way. On that same note, they've recently come out uh, and worked with Novolog, which is a branded short-acting insulin. So they have a rely on Novolog that's available both as a pen and as a vial. The over-the-counter insulins were only available as a vial, so you would need to also get syringes and drop the exact you know, right amount of units and inject that. Of course, pens are a little bit easier, um, and so it's nice that they've incorporated that into their new offering here. For anyone who's uh, familiar with Novolog. Novolog is fast-acting insulin that's used typically at meal time, usually three times a day between three meals. Uh, this requires a prescription, unlike the other ones we just talked about. But 
it is significantly cheaper. So the vial, all vials typically are 10 milliliters each with 100 units per mil. So all of those vials are $72.88 um, with no, this is with no insurance, just with the prescription. And then five pens, so that would be 15 milliliters total, so a little more than the vial, and it's pre-filled and ready to use, is $85.88. For context, the same type of insulin, which is a branded type of insulin, um, on GoodRx, you can see I've pulled up a screenshot, can run you between, you know, two, on a, most of the time, two to $300. <clears throat> so this is significantly cheaper and definitely an option if you use Novolog and you're finding that your insurance um, is just not covering it adequately, adequately or you're falling into the donut hole and ending up paying up more anyway. Uh, without insurance, these um, files and pens are definitely cheaper. But once again, you need a prescription for this. Always consult your provider since different insulins uh, work in different time courses to see if it's possible that this would benefit you both financially uh, and for your insulin regimen. Next, we have Walmart's $4 prescription program. Uh, this is a list of low cost generic medications. Uh, you don't need any type of membership or you don't need to pay any fees to access this program through Walmart. The prices you see here are not with insurance. So this is not using any insurance. Of course, you do need a prescription. These are prescription medications. And the price varies based on the 30 day or 90 day supply. So I just looked at the list uh, uh, this week, the list updates periodically. So you know if you ever want to see if you have a medication on that list and you're paying for it more at a different pharmacy, even with insurance, um, you can go uh, Google Walmart $4 prescription program and we'll go through their list and see what's currently available for what price. Metformin is a very common, uh, often first started medication in diabetes, and it's available right now for $4 for a 30-day supply or $10 for a 90-day supply, as well as glimepiride and glipizide, other commonly used generic low-cost medications in diabetes. Um, there's some other ones that are at a slightly higher, even though this is the $4 prescription program, you could think of it as the 99 cent store. They still sell things that are a little bit more than 99 cents. And so here there are some medications that may be a little bit more uh, than $4. And that it will list that on the inventory list when you search this on Google. Um, so this is, again, another great resource for um, getting cheaper generic medication without having to use insurance. Uh, but again, it does require a prescription and this is through Walmart Pharmacy specifically. So real quick, why don't we test our knowledge and see what we have uh, found out through, through this cost savings uh, portion of the presentation. Uh, feel free to, to shout out the answer if you know. For the first one, true or false, you must have commercial insurance to use a copay card. It is true. Uh, true or false, Better Health Pharmacy in Santa Clara dispenses medications completely free of charge. This is also true. And then uh, the Walmart OTC insulin may work differently than, than the prescribed insulin that you have. So it's important to consult your provider, true or false. And that is True, that's right. It does work differently. So before um, you go ahead and look at that insulin, please uh, ask your provider if that's the correct insulin for you. Next, we're gonna talk a little bit briefly about uh, generic and brand medications. Before I get on this topic, does anybody have any questions about the cost programs we talked about or anything about that specifically? I think we're okay on questions. Awesome. All right, so let's talk about generic versus brand medications. So I'm gonna point out some commonly held beliefs about generic drugs, and we'll see if that actually holds out to the facts. So commonly we hear generics are not as safe as brand uh, medications. 
In fact, generic generics are sa as safe as their brand equivalent, but they're also available at a lower cost. So you see the figure on the top, generic is the same as brand. Generics are not as strong as brand drugs, so they take longer to produce the same results. In fact, generic is the, provide the same benefit and about at the same time uh, because they're in fact the same ingredient. Another one we hear often is generic drugs are more likely to cause side effects. Generic, generics don't have any side effects that aren't um, also found in the brand drug because again, these are equivalent ingredients. And that is because it is regulated under uh, federal law and um, analyzed by the FDA. So they have to have the same active ingredient, the same type of form, effectiveness, quality and safety, strength and provide the same benefits. So by, uh, by FDA uh, supervision, all of these medications have to be essentially identical to generics do to brand uh, drugs. A company may produce a branded drug, they have a patent on it for several years, maybe up to 10 years, when the patent runs out, other drug manufacturers are then free to see how those medications are made uh, and produce them at a much lower cost because they didn't have to do all of the research and development to putting this drug on the market. So the branded medications, they, they're more expensive because they're usually some sort of novel medication. They've done all this research and they put this medication out first. Now, when their patent runs out, Drug manufacturers just need to know how to make the medication since that first company has already proven um, this new medication is safe, effective, provides this benefit, that benefit has this side effect, et cetera. That's why they're about 85% uh, less than uh, brand. Nearly eight of 10 prescriptions for the US are generic drugs. Um, so that's also something important to keep in mind especially if you go into, for example, a hospital, many of those medications uh, are typically um, generics. I also advise all of my patients whenever they're picking up anything over the counter, Tylenol, um, ibuprofen, anything like that, so just go ahead and pick up the generic. I do it myself when I go to Costco, um, since again, you'll just be saving money with the same uh, medication. So real quick, just to go over those points, uh, true or false, brand medications are more effective than generic medications. By the standard set uh, by the FDA, this is false. Generic and brand medications um, have identical what? Active ingredients, dosage form, strength, or all of the above? The answer is? All of the above stipulated again by uh, the way the FDA regulates these medications. Awesome. Before I move on to CGMs, do we have any questions on on brand versus generic medication? No questions yet. Feel free to put those in the chat if you have them or the Q and A. All right. On to. CGMs or continuous glucose monitors. So these are uh, devices used to measure sugar levels in the body that you may have seen a few commercials for them with some celebrities. I think one of the Jonas Brothers uh, is now advertising one. But uh, essentially these are glucose monitors that measure your sugar levels continuously throughout the day. So instead of the traditional uh, finger stick with a little bit of blood that you insert uh, onto the test strip, those give you one point in time, my blood sugar, for example, when I woke up before breakfast or right before I went to bed. Those are distinct time periods when you had a blood sugar level. What happened in between is only a guess because we don't have those levels. Continuous glucose monitors measure it continuously throughout the day. So it fills in all of those gaps in between. These devices use a sensor that you scan with a reader or a smartphone, either one. Um, and that collects the readings. So when you scan, uh, you get a reading, you can see what your uh, sugar level is at that time. Um, but even when you don't scan, these sensors are still measuring your sugar level. So they're filling in all of those gaps that you 
have in between of the times that you would normally check your, uh, your sugar level. It does not require a finger stick. These are usually sensors that are placed on either the arm or the abdomen. Um, they're placed for 10 to 14 days, depending on which one you get. And after you place it, you just swipe your reader or your smartphone about an inch away from the sensor, and then it automatically picks up the data. It's important to note that when you do a finger stick, you're checking um, a, a blood sugar level, right? Because you get the blood that you're actually analyzing. When you're using a continuous glucose monitor, you're me measuring what's called interstitial fluid, which is just fluid in between tissue. Um, and that will go into as why there is a little bit of difference between the readings. So the continuous monitor, as we were talking about, it shows the trends in between uh, in between those readings, you can see if your blood sugar has been going up throughout the day, going down throughout the day, has it been going up with certain meals, et cetera. And they can also really neatly alert you if you have low or high blood sugar. In the cases, especially when you have low blood sugar, we always recommend to double check with the traditional blood uh, glucometer because with the blood glucometer, you're not seeing any lag. The sugar in the blood is the sugar in the blood. But with the continuous glucose monitor, you may see a bit of a lag because we're measuring the interstitial fluid. It's about 10 minutes of lag time. So if you were to get a low blood sugar reading and you had a CGM, you would still wanna keep your traditional uh, finger stick glucose monitor just to double check that reading since it's gonna tell you exactly at that time what your blood sugar is. Here's what they look like. So we talked a lot about them, but what are these mysterious systems? So on the left, we have Freestyle Libre, the common system we see ordered for our patients. And then we have the Dexcom G6. Usually I see more of the Freestyle Libre just based on coverage. It seems to be a little bit more inexpensive. Um, it, the Freestyle Libre, the sensor is this white disc you see on your screen um, and it's worn on the back of the arm in the tricep area for 14 days. And then it comes with a reader, but you can use your smartphone instead if you download the app. Um, and then you would just use that reader to scan that sensor and it would tell you your blood sugar and you would just replace that sensor every 14 days. On the right, you have the Dexcom, which is worn on the abdomen. The Dexcom um, has one more component. It has this like sticky area where the sensor is. It has this gray, gray device on top of the sticky sensor, which is the transmitter and then you have your applicator. And same thing here, you would put it on, the sensor needs to be changed every 10 days, the transmitter needs to be changed every 90 days, and you would just scan it and it would give you your uh, blood sugar, your, your sugar data for the period of time that you're looking at. What's really nice uh, about those, about the data that it pools is you can see on the right what it possibly could look like. So this is from a freestyle Libre. You scan at 112, that's your sugar level, but it also tells you all of the data from that day beforehand. So this is what we mean by continuous uh, glucose monitoring and the trends uh, in, your, in your sugar levels throughout the day. So I can see here, you know, my sugar level was pretty in range. Um, then I woke up, maybe I had a large breakfast or something, it went up. And then it kind of crashed as my meal uh, left, or maybe I took some insulin, et cetera. And here it's leveling out back at that lower level we saw earlier. And the green dot is when I checked it. So even though I, I didn't, even though I didn't check throughout all this time, it still pulls that data for you because it's constantly checking when you're not scanning. That's a major advantage because then you can see, oh, when I ran, my blood sugar was lowered because my muscles took that sugar in. Oh, when I ate this it didn't spike my blood sugar so much, but when I ate that, you know, maybe I shouldn't eat that because every time I have it, my blood sugar is in the 300s. The other nice thing about the Libre, and I'm not sure if the Dexcom does this as well, but it provides you this arrow. So that, that can tell you at the time if your blood sugar is going high, like it's just continuing to go up, uh, is it gonna be going down and then how fast, you know? So the arrow here is diagonal, it's kind of a slow rate going up. The arrow could be pointing up, which means it's very quickly gonna rise. That's very important if you have low blood sugar, you can get a low number, but you can see, oh, you know, if my number is 70, I'm, I'm concerned about it going lower. This continuous glucose monitor would tell you, well, maybe it's going up. So I, I wanna correct it, but maybe I'm not so worried. Versus 70 with a big down arrow, 
you know you need to intervene immediately to prevent that from going any lower. And it might provide you an alarm uh, at that time as well to make sure that you know, you're aware you're having a little blood sugar we need to correct this. Going off of that, all of that information, looking at the pros and cons of CGMs, I'm gonna start with the cons because I don't feel like there's very many of them um, and they're not too bad. Major barrier to using a CGM in type two diabetes is the cost. There is, uh, it's a little tricky to get them covered. It's easier if you have commercial coverage, it can range from anywhere, you know, to, you know, low, low amounts per month to maybe 50, 60, $75 a month if you have commercial coverage. For Medicare, there, if you use four insulin injections a day, so you use one long acting insulin injection and then three short acting insulin injections with your meals, it's usually covered pretty well. But if you have any less or you're not on insulin and you're on Medicare, then the insurance coverage becomes a little bit trickier. But, you know, as a, as a pharmacist um, that's been working in this, in the primary care space and all the other pharmacists and other, all the other uh, primary care uh, doctors uh, that work in primary, in the primary care clinics at Stanford, there is ways to, to possibly uh, get around this. We can uh, try to figure out if you really feel like a CGM will help you out or finger sticks are just too painful um, or just too cumbersome, there may be ways around that. So always uh, talk to your provider. Don't feel like this is out of reach for you. Other, other uh, cons is just that lag time that we talked about, um, which brings to the next point of you may still require a traditional glucometer. So anytime our patients transition to a CGM, we say, you know, keep that other glucometer handy at the house just in case. If you want to double check readings, you don't feel are right, or if you get a low reading and you want to double check for sure, um, that other readings are uh, going to tell you the exact blood sugar at that time versus this, like essentially what is a 10 minute lag when you use the CGM. But the pros, I think, vastly outweigh this, and maybe I'm biased, but uh, you have the continuous monitoring. So you're always seeing overnight what your blood sugar is. If you have any blood sugar drops overnight, that would be important to know, but you wouldn't know if you didn't have a system that continuously was checking for you. Uh, it doesn't require any finger sticks, which I know patients tell me can be painful, or you have to carry all the equipment when you go. Uh, you don't want to do that at a dinner table, et cetera. Um, you can use the reader or the mobile app on your phone. So again, the things you have to carry with you are, are much, much less. So honestly, maybe just the phone that you're already having on you would be able to give you your blood sugar readings. Uh, one major advantage with the newer systems, it can tell you uh, when you have low or high blood sugar. The alerts are most important for low blood sugar as low blood sugar is kind of the more uh, in the moment dangerous one. So if it drops to whatever level you specify, you can change it on the app. Um, it will then send an alarm, you know, blood sugar is at 75, and then you know, okay, maybe I need to take some glucose tablets, sit down, um, and raise this blood sugar before I do anything, drive home, et cetera. Other things, the sensors can be worn for a long time, so they don't need to be replaced often. As with finger sticks, you know, you have to do that daily, multiple times a day. And then the smartphone connectivity is very nice. Smartphone connectivity not only allows you to just have your smartphone to check your blood sugar, but it also allows you to connect with uh, your primary care doctor and they can then see your uh, readings before you uh, see them at your appointment. So they already know what's going on and they can be ready with a plan. Uh, it's just, you know, I looked at your blood sugar, this is what I think, maybe we need to do this. Um, so kind of eliminates the fact of you needing to write everything down and going over that and making it your appointment longer. So let's test our knowledge on CGMs. All of the following are advantage of CGMs except continuous glucose monitoring. Data can be trended and sent to provider automatically. They are less expensive than traditional glucometers or the sensors can stay on for 14 days. So which one of these is not an advantage? C. So all of these are advantages. The only uh, major barrier being they may be a little more expensive than traditional glucometers. But like I said, there may be ways to, to uh, see how we can bring that price down. True or false, you'll never need your traditional glucometer again after you switch to a CGM.
false. So you will still wanna keep that traditional glucometer around just in case you wanna double check the readings or you wanna double check your low blood sugar and in fact, uh, see if that, that number is accurate at that exact moment. Before we move on to supplements, our last section, does anyone have any questions on CGMs or continuous glucose monitoring? I think I see a few in the chat. I don't think there are questions on that, but people are definitely asking about how they can get connected to a Stanford Ambulatory Care Pharmacist. <laughs> That's an awesome question. I love that question. Um, we get patients referred to us by your uh, primary care doctor. So um, if you feel like you need uh, more assistance or oftentimes the primary care doctor uh, you know, wants us to look at the medication a little more closely, they'll loop us in and then you can get an appointment with us. So uh, speak to your primary care doctor and see if that's a possibility for you. We'd love to see uh, more patients. Great. And then one other um, question is um, maybe going over the process of getting replacement sensors. This person asked why well, I need to buy replacement sensors. So maybe explain yeah. that. That's an excellent question. Definitely should have put this in here, but uh, basically it's, it's just like a prescription, just like your other diabetes testing supplies. So if you're familiar with having a glucometer, you need to pick up, you know, 30 test strips every month, et cetera. It'll work the same. So for example, with the Libre, each sensor lasts 14 days. They're sold in a pack of two that last, <clears throat> usually they're sold in a pack of two that last 28 days. So basically a month. Um, and then you would just go to the pharmacy and refill it like you would refill any medication and that would give you your next set of sensors. And then if you could, of course, get more if you if your plan allows for like a 90 day refill and then you would get uh, six, six sensors, yeah. So just like any other test strips or medications, it's a refill that you pick up at your pharmacy. All right. Let's go into our last section, a very interesting topic about supplements and uh, different over-the-counter products for diabetes. So one major disclaimer about supplements, <clears throat> this applies to herbal supplements, vitamins, anything you find over the counter uh, that you don't need a prescription for. They are not FDA regulated for safety or efficacy. All of the claims they make on their product are non-specific by law because they don't have to prove anything when they release these drugs. If there are any safety issues, this usually uh, will be monitored after they're sold and then they can be pulled. Uh, for a long time, uh, there was this diet supplement uh, that used ephedrine from before. Ephedrine was found to have some heart issues, but this was after it was already sold and then it was pulled off the market. Uh, so that's kind of the process, the process and why we typically don't recommend <laughs> supplements because as a pharmacist, I can't guarantee what you're getting because the FDA didn't inspect it. There's no regulations on what you're getting. It should be noted that these supplements can interact and increase a risk of side effects of your medications, just as any other medication can. One way to verify, you know, of course, there are some supplements you, you know, you should be taking. Uh, if you've been told maybe you need to take a vitamin D supplement, look for this USP logo. <clears throat> the USP logo uh, is a company that verifies the contents of your supplement. So that's one way to check. And then always notify your doctor or pharmacist when you've started a supplement. Uh, you may think it's, it's not the biggest deal in the world since anyone could just pick it off the shelf, but Again, they can have interactions, they can have their own side effects. So it's always to, best to keep all of your healthcare providers informed. If you're not sure, you can ask the pharmacist at the counter at the dispensing pharmacy. Now, whether to use a supplement or not. So ask your provider if, you, if they think it's safe and it will actually benefit you. These supplements uh, are not meant to be cures. They can't diagnose anything. They can't prevent diseases. All of the claims they make are general, very general usually, such as good for stomach. <clears throat> I don't know what good for stomach means. Uh, that's a very general term uh, because they haven't been tested. When searching for information, make sure, and this applies to non-supplements as well, use trusted websites, government websites, um, 
so you don't you know get any false or misleading information if the claim sounds too good to be true it probably is this applies for more things than just uh supplements but works better than a prescription drug or totally safe or has no side effects especially the last two i don't know anything that isn't is like 1000 percent safe with no side effects most things always have a side effect um, and works better than a prescription drug, my question would be, let me see the evidence. And if so, why, is that, why aren't more people talking about it? I would love to give my patients the best medication. Natural is often used as a marketing term, but it is not equivalent to safe. It actually has no real meaning. It, anything can be called natural. <clears throat> and then always read the supplement facts on their label, especially of multi-ingredient products. So. If you take a multivitamin or some sort of multi-ingredient supplement for diabetes or something like that, there will, there will be like a proprietary blend um, that won't specifically tell you how much of each ingredient is, but they do have to list what's in there. They also have to list all the other types of ingredients. This is good to know because uh, you, you want to know what you're taking in. Is there a certain vitamin that you shouldn't be having? For example, if you're on warfarin, if you've heard of that medication, you can't you shouldn't be using extra vitamin K. The only way to know if your multivitamin has that is by looking at the supplement fact label on the back. Let's talk about a few specific supplements that are commonly found uh, to be marketed towards diabetes. <clears throat> so cinnamon, I see this a lot at Costco. So uh, it decreases insulin resistance or is thought to. <clears throat> Sorry, one second. All right, so it's thought to decrease insulin uh, resistance and increase glucose uptake in cells. The kind of recommend, I don't know if I call it recommended, but we see 250 milligrams twice a day as a common use of it. There's been one study that showed it did decrease your average blood uh, uh, blood glucose, your blood sugar. Um, and in that study, they there's a very wide range of, of doses from 120 milligrams to six grams, which is 6,000 milligrams uh, per day. And they used it for a short period of time, four to 18 weeks. Whether or not it provides benefit after that, that's a question that we can't answer because we don't have the data. It does have side effects. As I said, supplements have side effects. So allergic reactions are possible, <laughs> indigestion or flatulence. And then <clears throat> you want to <clears throat> avoid taking blood thinners or uh, if you have liver disease, you'd want to avoid cinnamon. So again, they have their own risks. Michael, there was actually a question of, um from the last section. Do you mind if I ask it now? Yeah. Okay, great. Somebody is asking about the um, what, how much they should uh, reasonably expect to be the difference from their freestyle Libre sensor versus a finger stick. So like if they get how many points off should be expected? Yeah, that's a hard question to answer because it really depends on the individual. Usually it's not much that five to 10 is reasonable. I would be surprised if it's like 20 or 30. Does that answer the question? Yeah. I think also um, noting at rate of change, like if you've just eaten and it's a higher glycemic food and the sensor data is changing, there is some lag. So it may be different in that instance, but if it's like a fasting yeah. number, definitely. That's a great point. Yeah. if you just eight, the difference can be larger. Right. <clears throat> Let's look at turmeric, uh, a newer supplement that's been hot on the market. So it's rated as possibly effective. Again, not the greatest evidence. Um, glucose, it increases glucose uptake in the cells or that's how it's thought to lower blood sugar. Up to 2,000 milligrams daily and divided doses is what we've seen in the, uh, in the data. Again, this is not a recommendation, but just something we've seen studied. Um, the evidence 
again, it's not the greatest, but they have seen 250 milligrams daily was associated with uh, delay in progression from pre-diabetes to type 2 diabetes. <clears throat> this isn't talking about if you already have type 2 diabetes, you know, what's going on there. This is preventing diabetes. So that's an important caveat of this uh, widely cited um, study. The side effects, very pretty rare, typically upset stomach with very large amounts. It can thin your blood. So if you took blood thinners, it may not be the best choice for you, um, and as well as in pregnancy. Other thing to note is that you should avoid turmeric root itself. So extract better than root because there have been some formulations that had lead in them uh, that are turmeric root formulations. Next, we have bitter melon. Um, really not a lot of evidence for its use. It, again, it's thought to increase the glucose uptake in cells, so pulling the sugar out for the bloodstream. In the studies, we've seen from two to four grams of powdered bitter melon used daily. Not a recommendation, just what we've seen. And really the evidence is there is much more evidence that needs to be accumulated before we can say that this is an effective supplement for diabetes. It can cause upset stomach, it can cause low blood sugar, um, and it's generally avoided in pregnancy and breastfeeding. Next, we have chromium. Chromium is a pretty common supplement we see. So chromium is a trace element. It's typically found in whole grains, high brand cereals, egg yolks, brewer's yeast. For a time, they thought brewer's yeast could lower blood sugar, but it was really more related to chromium. <clears throat> Meats, nuts, cheeses, broccoli, or other fresh vegetables, they all contain chromium. Um, it's often, uh, can be found by itself in this form up here, but it can also be found with some other like cinnamon and biotin, some other um, supplements that may enhance the effects of chromium, specifically biotin. It's possible that it can decrease how much sugar, sugar your liver is producing. So maybe there's some beneficial effect of taking both. Unclear precisely though. Most studied, uh, most studies show this medication being used at 200 to 1,000 micrograms daily. So the supplement for 800 kind of fits into that range. The often cited study for use of this medication is that it lowered A1C from 1.9 to 2.8%. But I would caution using that study because when you actually take a look at it, the population that they studied was, a, was not, uh, not in the US or not even in a Western country. And it was a rural population. So you really don't know how chromium deficient these patients were already prior to taking the supplement. So it doesn't address the fact that if you've had a proper amount of chromium in your body already, would extra chromium benefit you? Can't answer that. The study doesn't, doesn't look at that population. And then other analysis of uh, analysis of several studies have shown that there's really no or marginal maybe decrease of fasting glucose or A1C. Side effects can include upset stomach and headache, and no one should really avoid chromium. You get it in your daily foods. Was, there's no serious safety issues there. Alpha lipoic acid is another commonly used supplement. Not enough evidence to recommend its use, but uh, it's thought it may increase uh, glucose uptake in your cells. Um, the direction 600 to 1200 milligrams per day on an empty stomach is what we've seen in the uh, in these studies. There have been several studies that uh, show that uh, ALA may improve diabetic neuropathy. Um, Unclear if it actually slows the progression, but could uh, improve its symptoms. Uh, in terms of lowering blood sugar A1C, not a lot of great studies to support that. It has a few side effects, so upset stomach, vertigo, hypoglycemia, uh, when used with other anti-diabetic medications. And then um, avoid in hypothyroidism if you're uh, using chemotherapy. Or if you're if you're having uh, antacids in your medicine regimen, you, you would want to separate them out because the interaction could null the effects of the antacid. ALA is often found in 
spinach, broccoli, tomatoes, peas, Brussels sprouts, rice, bran, and liver meats. Um, so really, if you have the, plenty of those in your diet, I don't know if it's unclear if extra supplementation is necessary. Next, we have ben, uh, benfotiamine, a type of vitamin B1, which is also known as thiamine. This is, again, commonly marketed in, as a diabetes supplement. Um, it's anti-inflammatory. It can decrease nerve damage caused by high blood sugar, possibly really unclear. Uh, but thiamine is used uh, in, in uh, diabetes nerve damage or alcohol use nerve damage. There's really mixed evidence about its use in that neuropathy setting. There is not a lot of great evidence to support that it lowers blood sugar specifically. It's usually seen as 300 to 600 milligrams per day in divided doses when it is studied. Well tolerated and uh, really there's no reason you need to avoid this medication. In conclusion, there's a lot of um, uh, resources to help improve costs. Uh, you can use your CGM to really benefit your management of your diabetes. Generic medications are the same as brand medications by FDA regulation, but are very uh, much more affordable. And then before you use a supplement, always uh, check with your provider. And before I let you go, one last test, especially on the supplements, this is a passionate subject of mine. Um, are supplements labeled natural inherently safe? False. And then um, are vitamins and supplements strictly regulated by the FDA? False. That's why we can't give you more information on them. And that is all for uh, the lecture today. This is my email. <clears throat> Feel free to email me any questions you have, um, but I'll take some questions now. Great. People feel feel free to add questions in the Q and A, and I can um, ask them. Ask Michael the questions. Um, maybe while we're letting people think about their questions, uh, did you have like sort of any um, anything you want to share about your experience in your residency at Stanford? Oh, so many experiences. Uh, so I started in July. Um, I spent 10 weeks in primary care and then I, you know, five days a week and I've spent since then like once a week in, in primary care. So it's been about four months. Um, primary care pharmacists love having patients uh, come visit us and having our appointments. There's a surprising number of diabetes medications and a lot of ways we can tailor your regimen to really fit you and uh, fit your concerns and needs. So if you ever have access to a primary care pharmacist, I would very much, uh, very much advocate for you to see one if that's possible. Um, some of the things I've learned uh, throughout this residency from the primary care pharmacists that already practice at Stanford would benefit a lot of people I know. It's just, uh, it's not available everywhere. So that's one thing I would say. Definitely see if you can come visit us. Great. Excellent. I think that most of the questions I think got answered as we went. There's no, no other questions. Um, so I think that, I think the biggest question people are asking is how they can view your lecture later. So we record all of our lectures for the wellness series um, and we actually host that house them on our website. I can send it uh, the link um, right now through the health library. It's also through our Di diabetes care program website for Stanford. Um, so you can get to them both ways. Um, but I put the link in the, in the chat if anyone wants to click and save. Um, to see this talk, and we've had a lot of dietitians talk, and Dr. Basina do some lectures. Um, Mags, one of our nurse practitioners, did a lecture on exercise as well. Great question and great content. So thank you so much. Um, so if there are no more questions, I think that concludes tonight. Um, and next month um, in December, Anna Simos is our diabetes care program manager, and she's going to do um, a holiday celebration on Zoom. So um, we hope that you all can join for that. So thank you all.